You're listening to Sacks in the Basement, a production of the Broadcast Basement Limited, where every show is 30 minutes of good and comes from a basement bar on the south side of Chicago. Pull up a stool, pour a cold one, and join us right now for Sacks in the Basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always at SacksInTheBasement.com. This week, I've gotten a ton of of messages and voicemails and things left at SocksInTheBasement.com and they've all come flooding through my email system. And I'm starting to think that people weren't getting their messages through and I just didn't know it. So next episode, I'm going to tackle the pile of listener mail, listener voicemail, whatever we want to call it. I'm not ignoring you. I don't think I was getting your message until recently. Socks have another homestand as well. The Socks Nerd is going to talk a little bit about that. And we have the author of the book, Last Comiskey. The book came after the documentary. We'll tell you all about it. Oscar Colas is no longer on the team. He was around for what, a day? He gets sent back down to Charlotte, even though we probably need another outfielder. And instead, Zach Remillard is back on the roster. And I know we haven't heard anything explicitly yet, but there's so much smoke around the idea that Pedro doesn't like Oscar Colas. It really feels like a general manager wanted to see playing time and the manager didn't want to give him playing time and the GM's like, well, it's not time to fire the manager yet, so I'll get him back down to AAA and get him more at-bats. Yet, Pedro, yet. If you're heading out to the ballpark during this homestand, of course, stop by Cork and Carey at the park, the official home of Sox in the basement in the shadow of the ballpark at 33rd in Princeton. Forget better at the ballpark. I'm ripping it off and I'm changing it to better at the cork. Life is better at the cork. Have you seen that menu? Great food at a great price. Award-winning food that you don't have to run around the ballpark and try to find. It's all right there with friendly service, a big giant bar with all the latest and greatest in local craft beer, familiar favorites, spirits, and wine. Your place for pregame, postgame, and in-game viewing. 33rd in Princeton, cork and carry at the park. On the last episode of Socks in the Basement, we talked a lot about what this team really is and who could be on this team and what their role would be next year. And then I see a couple of lineups come out and I see some more offense happen and I see Pedro doing a lot of things that we were saying, hey, you got to start doing this. You got to start running a little bit. Even if you run a guy out of an inning, you got to start advancing runners. You got to start understanding you're a 250 hitting team with not a lot of home run hitters on your team. You have to create a lineup and manage With that in mind, and I I don't want to pretend that it's because Sox in the Basement told him to, but you can actually see some results where he is conveniently doing some things that we said you have to start doing over the last couple of games against the Guardians. And I, I just want to kind of add on as we start the show off, Ed, to what I was kind of describing as their lineup for 2025 and how you get to it where you have a Gavin Sheets who's playing really well right now. I don't necessarily believe it, but if he does it for the whole year, yeah, he's in your he's in your lineup. He's on your team. He's your starting first baseman because Andrew Vaughn hasn't shown me that he's better than what Gavin Sheets is doing right now, or maybe they're in a platoon. But the combination of the two of them, if you're going to be competitive next year, I still believe are batting in the 6, 7, 8, or 9 spot. The Andrew Benintendi experiment gets moved down the order to the six, seven, eight, nine spot. Whatever you're going to find in terms of that outfielder that's going to play with Benintendi and Robert, whether it be Fletcher or Colas or Deloach or whatever, is in that six, seven, eight, nine spot in your lineup next year. And Corey Lee and another catcher, probably in your six, seven, eight, nine spot. And I've gotten high on him. And then when I look at your your top five spots, like I said before, Colson Montgomery, you're hoping, gets in there, along with Luis Robert Jr. coming back and being healthy. And then you got to find three bats. And that's why Lenin Sosa hitting in the top five spots makes sense to me. Because if you're going to be looking at essentially, you got to find a third baseman, shortstop, second baseman, and probably you're going into that big pool of first baseman and free agency next year and selecting a first baseman that will play some first base in DH and rotate with the Vaughn sheets, whatever comes out of that next year. If you're going to be looking at infield positions, essentially, that you're going to be adding in half the bat in the top half of your lineup, you need to find out whether or not Lenin Sosa has a role as one of those guys. 
And I don't think it's crazy when you look at his minor league stats that if the guy gets consistent at bats, he could turn into a guy that hits for a pretty good average and 25 home runs, Ed. Oh, well, yeah, and, and that's where, you know, the, the problem with the White Sox farm system was never that it was completely bereft of talent, okay? And Lenin Sosa is a guy that is not untalented. Now, he'd been given a couple of cups of coffee, he'd been given a couple of opportunities, quote-unquote opportunities, but really, he would play a day, he would he would sit for a couple of days. He'd play a couple of days, he'd sit for a while, he'd be up and he'd be down. He never really got the consistent look. Now, you've got a team that is just absolutely f- floored with injuries and and Yohan Moncada is out until July. So you're going to be looking at Lenin Sosa having a real shake for the first time, okay? Because he's not necessarily going to be someone that is just going to sit on the bench with this team because they don't really have a guy right now that that is blocking him, that is preventing him from getting his at-bats. So if he gets a real chance to show and establish and get used to the major leagues, because there is a there's there is a transition period, and I think you know sometimes as fans we sort of forget about that because we've seen stars come up and have immediate success, and we were told by the previous regime that our stars will come up and have immediate success because they're that good. No, Lenin Sosa can absolutely still prove that his minor league stats were not a fluke that he can translate that over into the major leagues, there was always a little bit of a dip, right? We've talked about this with somebody like Oscar Colas, who had a not-so-great strikeout rate in the minors, and it translated into a really abysmal one in the majors, okay? Because there's a drop-off there from, from a hitter standpoint. So I wouldn't expect Lenin Sosa to be better than he was in the minors, but he can certainly establish that, like you said, can he hit for average or at least a high enough average? Can he hit in the high 200s, right? Can he, he come close to 300? Can he hit 25 home runs? Well, that would be welcome on this team somewhere in this infield because home run hitting is just not part of what the DNA of the White Sox lineup is right now. I think he can do all of those things because here's the thing. I do too. I do. I really do too. Here's what's lost. There's a couple of names on this team right now that I think have been dismissed by Sox fans because of our anger over Kenny Williams and Rick Hahn and how this has gone over the last couple of years. We've kind of dismissed some players and there's two of them. Lenin Sosa is the first one. Here's a guy who at every level performed, and the only thing you would see is the first 50 games or so, when he would go to a new level, he would struggle. Now, the difference between all those other levels and the major leagues is that in all those other levels, he was put out there consistently to figure it out. But in the majors, he has never been given that consistent playing time. Never. The White Sox have never given him consistent playing time. So he's he's gotten a shot up here, but has he gotten a chance to really work through the problems like he did at all the other levels? Because when he was given that opportunity, he would become basically the same statistical hitter that he was at the level right below. And when you look at his 2022 season between double A and triple A, he hits 23 home runs and hits 315. He goes in 2023 and hits 17 home runs in the minors and six in the majors, 23 home runs. He actually matches his home run total, even though he moves up. Instead of it being half double A and half triple A, it's half triple A and half the AL Central. And he ends up with the same total for the year. His batting average dips a little bit, but again, there's the adjustment. I would like to see this guy get consistent at bats. You have nothing to lose this year by putting a really solid defender who has a track record from level to level of once he gets consistent at bats figuring it out, you're looking for players, let him play. Him batting in the three-hole made sense to me. A lot of people laughed at it the other day. I was like, no, here's a guy that if he actually was able to get consistent at bats may turn into something. There's not a lot of guys like that on this team right now. I have more belief that Lenin Sosa can actually improve off of what he is right now and become somebody who hits 25 home runs a year with a high average, I believe in it more than Andrew Vaughn right now. Because Andrew Vaughn's been at the major league level for years with consistent at-bats, and I haven't seen anything out of him that changes what he was over the last couple of years. There's actually more of an arrow for Sosa, if you can believe that, at least in my mind. And then another guy that I want to see getting consistent at-bats and is starting to get them is Corey Lee. 
Yes. You know, I, I just added him to my fantasy baseball team. Nobody I, I cares about that. my right fantasy. On, yeah, nobody right cares. Before, right before we jumped on, I, I'm looking, I'm like, oh, he added Corey Lee. Look right. at that. And I put him in my minor leagues. I get 14 minor league spots. This is where I keep my prospects, guys, that I think may turn into something. But the decision was made today by me because I I was looking at him differently today. Much like you may look at your house and want to see it differently this summer. And one of the ways to do that is a new exterior window door, patio door, or storm door. Indulge me for a second here before we get into Corey Lee, just so I can tell you about window and door superstore of Oak Forest. No high pressure sales, no pictures in a book, nobody sitting in your living room. Instead, you go into their showroom, all examples right there for you to look at, touch, feel, get excited about. Owner in showroom, owner on site during the install, along with their own window and door superstore installers. They don't farm out the work. They've been doing it this way for over 40 years in Oak Forest since 1985. Every major brand, custom made, no stock items. That way you get a perfect fit. Window and door superstore of Oak Forest is located a half block east of 159th and Ridgeland at 6280 159th Street. Make plans this weekend to stop by and see everything they have to offer and also see more at windowdooroakforest.com. But back to Corey Lee, and I am looking at him in a different way. I told myself, let's forget that he's a Rick Hahn acquisition when I hated Rick Hahn. Let's forget that he was part of this absolute train wreck of a year last year, and he's part of this terrible start this year. Let's forget the fact that we kind of discounted him in spring training. Let's take his affiliation with the Sox and how he got here off the board, and let's just look at him as a player. And when I did that, I saw a guy who was drafted in the first round in 2019 who then lost his 2020 season because of COVID in the minors. So he doesn't even get his 2020 season. So what does he do in 2021? The guy goes from high A to double A to triple A in the course of one season with a combined 277 batting average while he's out there in a 777 OPS as a catcher. That's pretty good for a catcher. You don't get that with a lot of catchers. Okay, so then he gets in 22, 446 plate appearances in triple A for Houston, and he hits lower. He's around 240. But his OPS is at 790 and he has 25 home runs. They give him a cup of coffee. In fact, they give him basically the same amount of plate appearances as he's had this season for the White Sox. And he does terribly in his first 26 plate appearances. He looks awful. So they send him back down to AAA. And the White Sox acquire him at some point. And that AAA season between Houston's AAA and the White Sox AAA in 23, he hits 278. He's got an OPS also in the 700s. The home runs come down a little bit. But sometimes you get fluctuations when you're trying to work things out. You don't know what the Astros told him that they wanted him to do. You don't know what the White Sox told him that they wanted him to do in the minor leagues. But he still was performing very well for a catcher. He came here, and he didn't do very well. But again, a very small sample size. Here's a guy who has less than 100 at-bats going into this season, who, when given opportunity, has accelerated quickly through the minor leagues and is a first-round draft choice. I would much rather see him... Every single night out there over Maldonado or Stassi. If the Sox make the mistake of bringing Stassi back and sending Lee down to the minors, I expect him to rake. The only bad thing is going to be we'll go in the next year going, what is he? Because we didn't give him a lot of major league at bats. This guy's got to play. He and Sosa have to play along with Gavin Sheets to see if it's real. And guys like Vaughn and Ben Benintendi better figure themselves out because they're moving down the list in my mind and they should be moving down the list in the mind of the White Sox management. Well, and with both of those guys, you know, you have, like you said, potential. We just don't know what they are yet. Okay. Versus Andrew Vaughn, who is the poster child for what the White Sox used to do wrong in terms of rushing guys to the major leagues. Because Andrew Vaughn also lost his 2020 season, right? He also lost it to the COVID season. And then in 2021, he's anointed in the major leagues as the next big thing for the White Sox because that was when Rick Hahn had him penciled in because he figured he'd get a full season in 2020. They never adjusted for the guy, okay? Normal baseball development, normal sports development – all right, if you have minor league systems, if you have these things going on, is that you give guys a chance. And sometimes it just because they're not 23 anymore doesn't necessarily mean that their careers are over. And this is where analytics, I think, is is starting to, to hurt sometimes because Corey Lee probably doesn't fit something. And Lenin Sosa may not fit something that 
the analytics say he should, okay? But that doesn't mean he's a bad ball player, either one of them. So yeah, Corey Lee should be in there more often than Martin Maldonado because you're not, frankly, you don't have a young pitching staff where Martin Maldonado is helping a bunch of rookies. Maybe down the stretch, you start doing that. Maybe when Nick Nostrini comes here, he's handcuffed to Martin Maldonado for a while because Maldonado is going to help this rookie out, okay? Maybe you're doing something like that. But I'm sorry, Corey Lee can catch Mike Soroka. He can catch Eric Fetty. He can catch Chris Flexen. These are veterans. What is Soroka doing or what is Fetty doing right now that requires a personal catcher? I haven't seen him do anything that's that spectacular. It's not like they're going out there and throwing darts and have a whip down at like 1.10 and they're keeping guys off base. The two of them still haven't shown me enough that I'm like, yeah, I definitely want him in my rotation next year. Well, not only that, but but you know when you had a personal catcher for for star pitchers, the the theory would go that this catcher was so hyper focused on what this star pitcher did that they actually made it better. Okay, that they they made them better. So when when a Greg Maddox had his own personal catchers, it was because that catcher was able to catch and frame Greg Maddox's particular pitches very well. Was able to read Greg's mind and 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 do that. I'm sorry, nobody really knows if Corey Lee and Eric Fetty can work together very well because they haven't worked together all that much. Nobody knows if Corey Lee can work together with Mike Soroka or Chris Flexen or anybody on the pitching staff at this point, even even Garrett Crochet, because there's just there, there's not a big enough sample size to really make that determination. And I don't discount that Martin Maldonado behind the plate is still a guy that a lot of teams would love to have back there. But again, what do you have to lose by sitting there saying, okay, let Corey Lee finish his, let him be the Cody Rhodes of the White Sox and finish his story, (laughs) okay? He started with the Astros, with Martin Maldonado as the guy that was supposed to make him into a complete catcher. He can finish that on the south side. Awesome. And with that WrestleMania reference out of the way, let's get to the Sox nerd. (laughs) Joining us on the phone line right now, the guy who puts up all the great tidbits on the scoreboard. If you're going to the game this weekend, this homestand, you're going to see something put up there by the Soxner, Dave Marin, and he is brought to you by the Village of Lamont. Want to experience downtown with real history, great eats and drinks, and green spaces filled with adventures? Visit the Village of Lamont. Shop, dine, drink, explore, and see everything they have going on this weekend and beyond at LamontDowntown.com. Nerd, how you doing? Fantastic, Chris. How are you? I'm great. Everything's wonderful. White Sox baseball, catch the fever. What do you got for me this week? Chris, here are a few nuggets on the injured Yoan Moncada, just in case we've seen the last of him in a Sox uniform. We were all stoked about Moncada back in the day, weren't we? The fact that he was a top prospect and so young and so powerful and so athletic made him the preferred choice over another prospect in the sale trade with Boston. That prospect's name, Andrew Benintendi. We can all point to one date, August 10th, 2017, as the moment when Sox fans thought Moncada was going to be something special. On that Thursday night at Guaranteed Rate Field, Moncada hit a game-tying homer in the ninth and a walk-off shot in the 11th as the Sox stunned future World Series champion Houston 3-2. to Because of his position and the fact that he was a switch hitter, Moncada always gave me good material for the scoreboard. For instance, he is third all-time among Sox switch hitters with 93 home runs behind Jose Valentin's 136 and Ray Durham's 106. He's also just one of eight Sox players to homer from both sides of the plate in a game. He joins Ken Henderson, Reigns, Brian Simmons, Nick Swisher, Valentin, Melky Cabrera, and, of course, Larry Garcia on that list. Moncada is one of just nine Sox players with two five-hit games in a season. He did that in 2022. In addition, he and the great Buck Weaver of Eight Men Out fame are the only Sox switch hitters with multiple five-hit games. Both those five-hit games were five RBI efforts, which really puts Moncada in elite company. Moncada and the Cubs' Chris Bryant and Phil Cavaretta are the only players in big league history with two five-hit, five-RBI games in one season. Those are some unbelievable bits and pieces, but injuries and COVID certainly prevented Moncada from amassing more nuggets like those. 
Before I get to my zinger, I remind you pearls like these can be found on my website, which can be accessed at SocksInTheBasement.com. My zinger, on Wednesday, Gavin Sheets became the first player in White Sox history to amass two doubles, a homer, five RBIs, and a steal in the same game. He was the first big leaguer to do it since Josh Naylor, who was one of the guardians that victimized the Sox on that night. Naylor did it in 2023. By the way, there have been just 18 players in big league history with that combination in a game. That's it, Chris. More than you wanted to know about yo-yo, switch hitters, five-hit game, and the prolific Gavin Sheep. All right, here's the deal. When you combine State Farm Home and Auto Insurance, you save an average of $889. Wow. State Farm agent John Harrell is ready to help you combine home and auto and save in the Chicagoland area. Call 708-481-4500 today. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Average annual per household savings based on a 2019 national survey by State Farm of new policyholders who reported savings by switching to State Farm. Joining me on the phone line right now, uh, after the last Comiskey documentary came out, you thought you had seen it all, and now there is a companion book. Uh, our guest is author Ken Smoller, who jumps on socks in the basement. How are you, Ken? I'm doing fantastic. Thanks for having me. I don't know if everybody saw the documentary, but if they didn't, they should go and take a look at it if they're a Sox fan, especially if they're of a generation that spent time in that ballpark. I always loved old Comiskey. I was sad when it went away. Uh, It is my favorite ballpark in all of ballpark history, and I have nothing but great memories as a child uh, going to ball games at that park. What What was your connection to it? That got you to the point where I know you were a contributor when it came to the documentary, but now writing this book, uh, expanding the world of Last Comiskey just a little bit more. Uh, What was your experience that got you to this point? Yeah, I've been a White Sox fan really since the crib. I had a a red White Sox hat on my head when I was in my my crib and was a Sox fan all my life. I got to experience Comiskey Park for about uh, 14 years, I guess. And during the final season, it was after I'd become a real avid photographer during high school and college. I was a college photographer at the University of Michigan on the student newspaper, the Michigan Daily. And during the last season, I really felt that I wanted to preserve for my own memories, but wasn't sure if anyone else was doing it, every nook and cranny of Comiskey Park. I took a couple days off of my summer job while I was a uh, freshman and sophomore summer and um, and you know, took my camera and walked all around the park multiple times outside, inside the concourses, et cetera, and took photos of just every aspect of the park. In addition to that, I was able to get a press pass for one game and got some of the behind the scenes photos as well, such as manager Jeff Torborg in his uh, bull in his locker room office. I was able to get that photo and a few others. And when all was said and done, I had hundreds of photos of old Comiskey Park just gathering dust in negative boxes in my storage. And I contributed a lot of those for the documentary, but felt like Sox fans and baseball fans alike would really enjoy seeing what Comiskey Park looked like. Not just the ones who were there, but even more so the people who weren't there that were too young under the age of, I guess, about 40 years old, who couldn't experience the great ballpark and see what it was like. And maybe even more so, um, parts of the park that they didn't see very often and, and sort of the panoramic photos that many of them have seen. One of the parts of the ballpark that I always think of immediately whenever I think of that ballpark is the area behind the scoreboard. You don't think that there's even something back there when you see pictures, but I remember as a kid, the way the ramps crisscrossed and it would be like during a game, especially if it was a bad game, but during a game, it was like the original kid zone. Like people were like jumping from one ramp to another ramp. And there was like, there were these little hidden areas back there in the back of the ballpark. Is there a spot that you found interesting, intriguing that you think about all the time when you think of that ballpark? You hit the nail on the head because when I was old enough to leave my seat and wander around with my little camera, the first place I aimed myself towards was that center field area. And those ramps were just mesmerizing. You could watch the game from a completely different angle. 
You can get from the upper deck to the lower deck to the bleachers and that area. One of the things that was really cool that I got to see um, and photograph was there was this really weird statue in deep center field that was a statue and a little fountain. I don't know what the purpose of it was and what it was honoring, but there are all these little nooks and crannies in that in that corner. And I included a lot of those photos in the book because I, too, was captivated by it. Um, you also would see political type signs when I say political baseball politics. I have a photo in there of a N Nellie Fox in the Hall of Fame sign. People used to take bed sheets and mark them up and walk around and whatever whatever mission they had for the White Sox or baseball, they would parade them in those those uh, passageways that connected you from the lower deck to the upper deck. And it was just a place like nowhere else in, in any ballpark I've ever been to. Um, that whole center field area was really what caught my attention as a baseball fan. You know, obviously the scoreboard was mesmerizing with Bill Vex Monster coming up in 1960 and then converted to a modern version in 1982. What kid wouldn't love seeing fireworks after home runs combined with Nancy Faust playing na 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 and all the fans cheering? Even if it was a crowd of 5,000 fans, it was always loud there. And it was always a little mysterious in that center field uh, triangle. So the foreword to this book is written by Ozzie Guillen. And, you know, Ozzie strikes me as a guy who's not only very opinionated, but he talks really fast and he kind of jumps from, th you know, one subject to another subject. He, he also has a very good baseball mind. I mean, let's think about this. He's the manager that took this team to a world championship and they'll never take that away from him. Uh, what is it like as an author, as a writer, a professional, uh, getting a forward from Ozzy? Is he a pretty good writer? Well, you have to clean up some swears here and there, obviously. Um, you know, one of the things he did was he shared a lot of memories of his family and what it was like to take his kids. I've got a photo in there of Ozzy Jr. and Oni from when they were probably maybe five and seven years old, um, playing with Ozzy in the outfield. And one of his strongest memories was just what it was like to raise a family in Comiskey Park. He got to do it for a handful of years at Old Comiskey and then a New Comiskey. And it was really, you know, heartwarming to hear what it was like. I mean, I was always jealous as a little kid watching those guys out in the field. And their experience was just tremendous. And Ozzy talked about that, but he also just talked about what the park was like in terms of all the employees that worked there, the Andy Frayne ushers, the beer men, the same ones that would say hi to him every day. It felt like it was his family. He was there for so long. He was also the bridge from Old Comiskey to New Comiskey. He played five years at Old Comiskey and, of course, played a number of years and managed at New Comiskey. So more than anyone else, he really understands both of the ballparks. And one of the things that's really interesting about Ozzy is, if you recall, he did not like the old ballpark and couldn't wait to get out of it at the time. And then now, looking back on it, he talks very nostalgically about his memories of Old Comiskey. And after seeing all the other ballparks that um, came in the dozen years after New Comiskey, he really um, looked back on the, the first few years of, of New Comiskey unfavorably, realizing there was maybe a little bland and a little uh, lacking compared to the other new ballparks. Um, and he wrote about that as well. So he is, um, you know, filled with more information than almost any White Sox person that's alive today. There's an intimacy to that ballpark. There's when you went to a game there, you were right up on the field and you are you are much closer to the action. And there was just more of a feeling that it was you and the team taking on the other team. And then, of course, the characters that walked around it. Right. Like I've never seen Ribby and Rhubarb ever since they tore that place down. I wonder if there's a, a secret spot where they're laid to rest. I think I know where they are. You do? <laughs> I, I, I have heard rumors and I'm going, we have a big book launch on May 16th at the Chicago History Museum. And part of my plan is I need to go to the Mascot Hall of Fame in Whiting, Indiana. I have heard rumors that they are on display there. I mean, you need to check that out. I was worried they were buried underneath the parking lot when they tore down the stadium. That's what I was worried about. Listen, if we all remember the days, Sox fans would have preferred that. They did not get well received by Sox fans. And I think I probably <laughs> learned a lot of swears from uh, what Sox fans we're yelling at, at uh, old Ribby and Rhubarb. I've got a couple of great photos. I actually have a photo of them with Ozzy in the book. Um, I kind of liked them as a kid. You know, I always was jealous of the Philly fanatic and the chicken, uh, the San Diego chicken. But uh, 
they did not um, get well received at Old Comiskey Park. Um, and then, of course, there's Andy the Clown. You know, some people loved him. Uh, some people could not stand how he was always making noise. Um, he was a controversial figure, but he's, he's in the book as well. I've got a great photo of Andy from the last night game. Um, I was lucky enough to attend the last night and the last day game and was able to get a number of photos of, of those two real momentous days in, in White Sox and Chicago history. And a far more talented part of the ballpark, who I'm sure you've drawn a lot from, is former guest of this show and good friend of it, Nancy Faust, who is within that ballpark for so long. And she is a plethora of information. I would imagine she's all over this book. Yeah, she is all over this book. Every single interviewee seemed to talk about her from the movie. And in addition to that, I have a real heartwarming story in the afterword that I include about when my my son, who was, I think, about 12 at the time, we were visiting Phoenix, Arizona, and Nancy and I had been exchanging messages on Twitter, and I was asking her for some interviews for this book, and she said, why don't you just come on over to the house, bring your son, and she um, invited us, welcomed him into, into her home. My son got to meet her. Um, she gave us a little impromptu concert in her donkey barn in the back. It was the most magical experience hearing Nancy's organ play in a little cinder block room, the same songs that I used to hear at Comiskey Park as a kid. She is just a remarkable human being and um, really represents everything about that ballpark. You know, fan-oriented entertainment, um, a little bit of levity, a little bit of sarcasm, some irreverence as well. You know, a lot of her songs poked fun at the visiting players in a in a cheeky way that uh, she kind of jokes about that she couldn't get away with today. But she is, you know, um, one of the most important people in, in White Sox history in a lot of ways, because a lot of fans associate their experience with White Sox um, games uh, with Nancy. Ken Smoller has written Last Comiskey, the, the book that follows the documentary. I know you can pre-order it right now. It's coming out officially at the end of the month. Ken, how do people get the book? Yeah, sure. Go visit the website for the book. It is lastcomiskeybook.com. That's lastcomiskeybook.com. It has uh, over 400 photos, possibly I think about 450 photos of Old Comiskey, um, as well as all sorts of aspects of White Sox history. Um, I really hope Sox fans enjoy it. Um, it is, um, like I said, coming out um, at the end of April, and then we have this big book launch, which is free to all Sox fans. Um, and there's information on that website as well about how to get to the book launch, which will include some former Sox players. So it's lastcommissiebook.com. Ken, congrats on the book, and uh, I expect it to be a big success because I know that documentary uh, had some legs, that's for sure. Yeah. And I appreciate you jumping on Socks in the Basement, and, and good luck to you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Have a great weekend. Socks in the Basement. Socks in the Basement. Socks in the Basement. Socks in the Basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found, and always on SocksInTheBasement.com.